Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here with some instructions for the 144,000 coming out of Matthew chapter 10. That's right, Matthew chapter 10. Um, I was reading around in, in Matthew not too long ago, and you know it jumped out at me. You know that this this whole chapter is instructions for the 144,000. One of the things you have to understand is the 12 disciples were a living parable or they were an example or they um they they were the 144,000 now you say well why were there only 12 of them instead of 144,000 of them you have to remember that when the messiah was a baby that uh, herod came in and had all of the children killed and that's what he was doing that's what herod was doing was he was killing the the 144,000 he killed um the way it appears, the way, the way I read it, he killed all of them, except he didn't get to the Messiah, and, and he had a few left, um, and they were named, and some of them that, that were left were named the 12 apostles, all right? So, <clears throat> let's look at this right quick. Matthew chapter 10, he says, And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease now see this is the power that the 144,000 have now you guys have this power now you can um, cure all manner of disease it's just a matter of understanding how to pray for a person in the third testament of the bible you know we teach that over here in Hermes academy it teaches you how to pray for sick people it tells you the words to use which are similar to what you find there in matthew uh, chapter 6 which is the i believe matthew chapter 6 but it's the lord's prayer where you use uh, words like our father who are in heaven hallowed be thy name those three parts are necessary to an effective prayer and you learn that in that section but it also tells you how to actually put your hands on the um the part of the body that's um, being affected by the illness, the part that's hurting, so to speak. And then it tells you even what to do afterwards. You know, it even tells you what questions to ask them. You know, do you feel any better now? And then come back a few days later and you pray for them again and ask them. It, it teaches you how to heal these people. You also have the power against unclean spirits, people who actually have demons. You can cast them out. You 144,000, you do have that ability. You do have that power. You got the power to stop the rain, too. You just got to know how to do it. Uh, look at number two. It says, now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Labaeus, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Okay, so those are the twelve apostles. You know, sometimes people will ask, or sometimes you'll wonder what their names are, and you can see them there. Those are those are who they are. And again, I'll say those were 144,000 ers. There, there's a video that I put out, and I hope I get the chance to let me write it down so I can link to it. Um, they it's a video I put out, you know, talking about the 144,000 were killed as uh, babies, and I may repost it here along with this one. But um, check out that video. It's really, really interesting, and it out it, and I believe it will help you to make the connection between the twelve apostles and the hundred forty-four thousand. But we're going to go on. Look at verse five. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, "Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, into ye not." Okay. Now, like I said, this is instructions for the hundred forty-four thousand. Okay. So. If you are uh, 144,000, 144,000 wannabe, or friends of 144,000, or you're looking for somebody that is 144,000, well, you should be looking for them to be following these instructions, all right? So let's take these a little bit slow. Now, it says, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Now, first of all, you have to understand who the Gentiles are, okay? Now, at the time that this book was written, you had you still had bloodline Israelites walking around people who looked like the Messiah people who still had the same physical traits of Abraham Isaac and Jacob you know but we understand now in 2019 and going forward that 
the word Israel is a spiritual name. It's talking about spiritual beings. So you can't necessarily look at somebody's skin tone and tell whether they are Gentile or not. You have to look deeper than that. You have to look at what their belief systems are and where they are. You know, whether they are, I was talking to a young lady yesterday that really helped me to understand this. You know, it's really based more on your belief systems than it is on your heritage at this point. Right. But it's telling you don't go to those who are outside of the belief systems, I believe is what it's saying here. Don't go to those who are um, into um, and refuse to give up their uh, pagan pagan gods and um, um, that side of thing. The Gentiles, like I said, I, I really want to stress that when he says Gentiles and Israelites that he's not talking about something you can really see, but he's talking about. Who, who you are on the inside at this point because Israel was a spiritual name so Gentile would have to be a spiritual name too but let me go on he says and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not now you have to understand who the Samaritans were if you um, study the scripture you know that the 12 tribes of Israel split up Israel or his first his name was Jacob at first he had 12 children um, and you by the time you get down to Solomon, which you heard about, you know, he was the wise guy in the Bible. His he, Solomon made uh, errors. Solomon, he was not, he, he was considered very wise, but he did some stuff in his latter years that got him in trouble. Basically built uh, pagan temples for, you know, some of his thousands of women that were in his life. And that got him in trouble. And it basically, him being a king, it put a curse over all of Israel. And that curse was that the the twelve tribes would be split up. Ten of them went to um, into Assyria. Ten tribe, ten of the twelve tribes went into Assyria, um, and actually assimilated into that group. They, you know, they started breeding, or I shouldn't say breeding. They started um, um, marrying into the Assyrian culture, and they never came back out. They, they, they. If you go into Syria or Assyria and those places now, you can still see. Um, these people over there, they're still there. Those are the Samaritans. Those, those, those ten tribes are the Samaritans. That's why um, when the Messiah was walking around, the lady said, "Hey, um, um, you're not supposed to be talking to the Samaritans. You, you, you Jews, according to the King James version, you Jews don't talk to to the Samaritans. It's it's kind of because they they were off track. They they were a different kind of group." Um, there um, would have been into the pagan, you know, rituals of the um, Gentile nations that they were a part of that they had assimilated into. And so the, the Jews were kind of avoiding those guys. And he's telling them here, don't go into those, into those nations. Don't don't go over trying to talk to those people. But look at verse six. He says, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he's talking about the believers who are now lost. And I would argue that this is 99% of all of Israel today. Everybody today, you know, we look at the world systems of today and it's hard to believe that these world systems, these beast systems as the Bible call it, are off track. It seems like everybody is doing, you know, um, living their lifestyle in a certain kind of manner and it, it seems odd when you think that you know maybe we should be living a little bit different or maybe we should be doing things different maybe we should be following the old um, uh, mosaic laws and such seems odd and so they're lost because they because we we live in this manner Israel is now lost Israel is very lost and that's why you have 144,000 in, in the um, father's divine plan he set aside 144,000 individuals who will come during the tribulation period when they need them the most to actually help lead these lost sheep back to where they're supposed to be and that's who he's instructing you guys to go talk to all right now let's look at verse 7 as ye go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand now you know <clears throat> this is a really really interesting phrase the kingdom of heaven is at hand because when you look back in the gospels you find out that this is the first words that 
the Messiah spoke on record. When you pull out your red letter Bible, this is pretty much the first red letters that you see is the Messiah said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, that was 2000 years ago. He wasn't speaking in future tense. The Bible, the Bible is is very specific in the words that it uses. And when he say is at hand, he meant right now, you know. <clears throat> And it was. It was there right now. You have to remember the purpose of the one of the purpose. He had many purposes of being here. But one of the purposes of the Messiah was to usher in the Piscean Age. The Piscean Age. The kingdom of heaven descending down on earth before the Messiah came. The kingdom of heaven was not available to anyone on earth. But after he was after you know i don't want to say after his death because you know he was living when he said these words after you know the period of time where he was um sent back to the earth maybe starting with the day he came back to the earth um or came back or, or you know maybe starting with the day that the word materialized itself into flesh that we now call the christ was the day that the kingdom of heaven was made available this place where you can actually live with the king talking about the creator our father in heaven that created the universe will be your king is what that means he he, he right now for the majority of people on the planet we have fleshly kings we may not call them kings all the time but you have presidents you have um um and i can't ministers or, i mean I, I can't name their titles but you have putin you have kim jong il you have donald trump you have uh pope francis and you know whoever's running the un right now these are our kings right now here on the earth but what the Messiah was saying there in verse 7 is that you have the opportunity to put away, put aside those earthly kings and take on the creator as your king is the message that he was saying there. And it's the message that the 144 were instructed to teach at the time and you are being instructed to teach right now. You know, I don't want to drag this on too, too, too much, but, you know, I want this, I want, I want something to be clear for people and that the bible was written for us it wasn't written for the people of old like the reverend pastor deacon dr doug once you believe that it's an old antiquated book written for jews way back long time ago i would argue that no it wasn't written for them at all because they never had the opportunity to see it and if they did they never had the opportunity to read it a bible wasn't made available for the public where every person could read it for themselves until 1611 a.d that's 1611 we're talking about you know uh four five hundred years ago so it wasn't written for those people thousands and thousands of years ago who never got the chance to read it it was written for us it was written for the end times and when you read it in its entirety you find out that it is actually a book of instructions for the end times you know the book is written for us all right but <clears throat> let's go on look at verse eight he says heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead Cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. These are the powers that you guys have, you know. And, 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 and again, I don't want to draw this out too much, but understand that the, the 144,000, the uniqueness about those guys, the unique, uniqueness about you, uh, 144,000 nerds, you guys, the, what's unique about you is that you're first. Everybody's going to have these powers eventually you know everybody's going to learn how to heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead cast out uh devils is that that you guys will learn to be first that's why you will be instructors that's why you will be helping the others you'll get the information first and you'll pass it on to the to to rest of humanity that will survive this tribulation but notice right there it says freely you have received freely you give that means don't don't take any any payment for the efforts that you do don't don't be like the reverend pastor deacon dr doug that you know holds out his hand for his payment after he prays for somebody or after he gives gives a sermon or something you know you know, I've, I've heard of preachers who will not do sermons unless you come up with a certain amount of money in order to pay him. You know, it was one guy who was trying to get somebody like T.D. Jakey or somebody to come to their church and, and, and give a sermon. And it was tens of thousands of dollars that was required for them to pay up front, you know, just to have this guy to come down to their church, you know. 
they limousines and all kinds of stuff they was expected to provide in order to get him to come down and and you know minister in their church the verse t verse 7 is saying don't do that you you didn't receive these gifts with payment td jakey didn't pay somebody to get the gifts that he has why is he now requiring payment for him to share the gifts with others so he's saying to to do what you do and do it freely all right now look at verse 9 he said provide neither gold nor silver nor brass for your purses he's talking about the ministry when you actually start to go out and the third testament talks about how you guys will go through a training period a kind of a wilderness period but then in the heat of the battle when the tribulation really gets to going how you know many of you guys were actually going to hit the road you're actually going to be out on the road ministering you're going, going to be going to the places where they need you the most provide neither gold nor silver nor brass for your purses meaning don't be trying to wait till you got enough money no don't because you know that that'll slow you down that'll stop you how many times have do you hear people say you know yeah i will come to visit but i ain't got no money i would do this but i ain't got no money the, the messiah the, the message here is don't let money stop you don't 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 be trying to you know get all your money together before you hit the road because you ain't gonna go you're not gonna go you're never gonna have enough money to to actually you know travel the world uh ministering to you know for the father's people he will provide what you need I look at verse 10 he says nor script for your journey neither two coats neither shoes nor yet staves for the workman is worthy of his meat so you know I guess what he's saying there is don't don't be thinking about how you're going to take care of yourself you go out there you do the job he will take care of you all right then let's look at verse 11 and he'll take care of your family back at home too is what the scripture says verse 11 says and into whatever city or town ye shall enter inquire in it who is worthy and there abide till you go thence all right so here you guys are you 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 are not quite at that point maybe maybe some of you are on the road already i don't know but whenever you go to a town you inquire who is worthy who is a believer who who is there who that the father has already prepared and who's ready to receive his word not everybody is ready to receive his word so what this is saying is don't be trying to force your way into some of these places if they're not ready if they don't want to hear the word it, that place is not really worthy of you so you find out who is who there is ready to hear the message that you that you are ready to give and you and you and you abide there you stay there now and that's where you lay your head is what it sounds like to me now maybe you know you will go out and you'll minister to them people in a day and you know suffer the uh, humiliations and abuses that you you know that comes naturally with this type of work but then at the end of the day you go back to those who are worthy um and and you abide with them i right, look at verse 12 he says and when ye come into a house salute it right salutation meaning that you you show like a military you bear no arms when you salute somebody you bear no arm you you, you basically a, a salute says that i bear no arms against you and so you salute the house um and verse 13 says and if the house be worthy let your peace come up on it but if it be not worthy let your peace return to you yeah you know it, it, like i said you guys are first you guys are early 144,000 you're just first so you, those that are going to come late to, or late I shouldn't say later those are the one going to become late they're not going to be worthy they're going to be you know some of the last holdouts and so when you find yourself in a position talking to one of these these individuals you know um, um, the, the best definition you know best word with the best definition is ignoramuses you know uh, ignoramus and i should look up that word and give you a definition of it but this is a pe this is a person who believes um that they know something and are willing to um express their thoughts emphatically when turns out they really don't know you know what they're talking about they're kind of arrogant and ignorant <clears throat> So when you find yourself in company with these people, it's not going to be a pleasant situation. You're going to lose almost every time. You know, they're going to humiliate you. You got to remember that these people are basing their belief systems on years and decades of what they've learned in, in our institutions, our schools, our hospitals. You know, um, they, they, this is what they've learned all of their life. And the scripture 
it's different when you come and you start talking you know um um scriptural doctrine to the people it's going to sound alien to them and they're going to use what they know plus their materialism and turn it against you what does it say um they um don't cast your pearls before swine kind of comes to mind because they're going to rend you they're going to throw your mess on the ground and then they're going to turn around and start hurting you you know that's that's what that phrase means cast not your pearls before swine so you let your peace return to you and you you walk off you know you, you all right look at verse 14 he says and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city shake off the dust of your feet yeah this this is for your own benefit guys it's, it's letting you know you don't it, you, you don't sit there and try to try to convince these people try to argue with them you know be going back and forth don't argue with the ignoramus because uh, onlookers may not know who's who and they, you may come across as the ignoramus when you're sitting there arguing with somebody who you know is arrogant and ignorant so what does it tell you to, to do it just tells you to turn and walk away you know, wipe the feet off, wipe the dust off your feet as you go, you know. <laughs> All right, look at verse 15. He says, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Yeah, it, this tribulation is going to be targeted, guys. You know, there's people right now who are starting to wake up and realize that we are in the tribulation but it's still it's still in tv land form you know they talk about well, yeah i see this and i yeah i see that yeah you see that on television and then when you get tired of it you switch the channel and go start watching something else well this is the early parts of the tribulation now we heard i don't know how long y'all been around the scripture but you know from one of the first things i've heard i heard about the tribulation over 25 years ago is that nobody was going to recognize the first half i don't know who i was listening to that gave that sermon you know it, it could have been a kenneth copeland or somebody you know back in you know back in the days when you know i, w I was listening to the reverend pastor deacon dr dud and but it, the message, you know, it reached me. It, it made sense that the first half, the first three and a half of the tribulation, nobody would really recognize that we were in it. And, you know, now that we are in it, I'm like, yeah, it's because it's like it's on television. It's like a television thing. It's like the only way you see that we are in a tribulation is if you turn on CNN or Fox News and start looking at the stuff that's going on around the world. If you're a person who is not watching the news, and I talk to a lot of people, you can imagine, it, the people who are not watching the news or watching television or, or you know or, or paying attention, they have no idea of the stuff that's going on. We've had more earthquakes in the last three four five years then it's happened in the last hundred years there's volcanoes going off there's there's famines there's wars and they, they, we talked about that country Assyria up there a few minutes ago where you know ten tribes of, of Israel went into this land of Syria Assyria look at what's going on with those people right now and how they're being bombed and killed and there's wars going on but like I said, if, if you're not into the news, you're not into that kind of thing, you have no idea that it's going on and the tribulation is marching straight past you. The thing is, the second half of the tribulation, everybody's going to know it. That's when it's going to get personal. It's not going to be on the news anymore. It's going to be in your living room or in your face, you know, um, then, you know, and then everybody's going to know it. And that's where the 144,000 come in is because you guys are being prepared now. You guys are understanding now. You're feeling the tribulation pains now. And so when the rest of the world wakes up, guess what? You guys are going to be standing there like, uh, yeah, uh, Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 24. You know, come on, let's get let's get to learning so we can, you know, figure out what it is that we're supposed to be doing so we can survive this thing. Remember, the, the goal in Hermes Academy is that we inherit the earth. Remember, the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. There is a certain people that's going to inherit the earth, not necessarily those people who are talking about, you know, we don't have to, you know, obey anything the Bible says because in the end times, the, the we all going to get, you know, uh, raptured off of the planet. Yeah, you're going to go off the planet, all right, you know, um, are you going to wake up in a place that you, you know, that you're expecting? Is the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug uh, accurate in his, his description of what's going to happen when this so-called rapture date comes? You know, I, I don't know, you know, remember the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug ain't read his Bible. 
He hasn't. You know, go ask him. You, if you still go to church, you know, in, in the middle of the conversation, ask him, you know, have you read the whole thing? You know, and, you know, see, he hasn't. He hasn't. What he's going to tell you is that he's read so much of it that he would like to think that he's read the whole thing. <laughs> That ain't the same, guys. You can keep reading Psalms 23 all of your life, and this is not going to help you with the rest of the scripture. But I'm starting to get a little preachy here, so let me go on. Look at verse 18. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You, you're like a sheep in the midst of wolves. But he says, be therefore wise as serpents. And harmless as doves. Now, serpents and doves, the two things that, that you know that they have in common is they're both quiet. They're they're both kind of they're both kind of quiet, they're both kind of, you know, um um I'm trying to think of a word that says they're able to to move through the world without being seen. And that's kind of what it's saying saying there. Um be ye therefore wise as serpents as harmless as doves. I know I messed that up, but let me go on. Verse seventeen but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in the synagogues. Yeah, you have this to come. Remember Matthew chapter 24 also talks about this, um, where you're going to be uh, scourged in the synagogues. You're going to be delivered up to councils. Now, this ain't going on yet. At least I haven't seen too much of it, except, except you know, maybe on television. But what you, what you guys are expecting is that when... The, when the tribulation gets hot and heavy, they're going to start persecuting you guys. They're going to start coming after you guys, you know, and the weaker amongst you, the ones who do not stand up for the word, the ones of you show, they, they show any kind of doubts. I'm afraid that some of you guys are going to be martyred according to what I read in the scripture. So it's really going to be hot and heavy. And he's telling you here that they're going to deliver you up, you know, when there, there, there's going to be a day and, 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 you know, this is what I believe. I can't really, you know, point to a scripture at this second, but there's going to be a day when you're going to be challenged on your faith. It's going to be you're going to have to stand up uh, for what you believe in. Do do you feel the spirit of God inside of you? Is he telling you what to do? Do you have the Holy Spirit in you that's called that's, that's instructing you and making and you you know do this and they may be asking you with a gun around your head or a gun to your head or you you know or you know a sword right there or you may be you know ready you know ready to suffer a guillotine or something based on what your answer is well those who stand up for the what does he say those who those who deny me i have to get that verse that says if you if you deny him in the, in that moment you're probably going to get martyred you know and and all i'm saying is it's just going to get rough you know at that point but let's go on um, 18 and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles yeah this is what I'm talking about you're going to have to stand up for your faith you're going to be standing in front of this judge or this guy explaining to him that no the father is real and he is inside of us he is he, he is guiding and leading us you know and this is because of materialism and ignorance this is going to sound strange to our governors and our kings and even the gentiles but you're going to have to stand up for it you know you're going to have to stand up for it all right <laughs> that's why that's why he's giving you giving us these instructions it's gone but when they deliver you up take no thought how or what ye shall speak for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak yeah and also guys remember that you have to be tranquil we learn in the third testament that you have to be tranquil when you, when 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 you find yourself in this position in order for this to happen you know what does it say in that it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak yeah but you have to have your tranquility on in order for it to come if you're if you're raising if you're mad if you're letting the people get to you and you're fussing and you're raising your voice and such um, it's, 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 it doesn't work that way. You have to be tranquil. You have to be quiet enough to hear the thoughts come from within that tell you what you actually say in that moment. And that's what's going to happen. You know, when they deliver you up, you're sitting there in the jailhouse in a little pen or whatever, waiting for your opportunity to go before the judge. Don't be in there taking notes. You know, don't be doing a Bible study right then. No, that's the time to be praying, you know, um, you know, uh, trying to, you know, make sure that when you do find yourself in front of the in front of the judge or whoever, the magistrate or whoever it is, that the spirit is able to talk through you. Look at verse 20. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father, 
which speaketh in you, but you have to be quiet in order to do that. Just want to stress that it's very important. It's it's important even in day to day stuff. You know, when you find yourself amongst these wolves who are trying to humiliate you, um, yeah, just get quiet on them. Just just calm down, take a breath, get real quiet, get real peaceful, hear them out, and also listen for the correct answer that you're supposed to supposed to give. And you win the argument. That's how you win an argument. You know, um, Dale Carnegie or somebody in How to Win Friends and Influence People said you can't you can't win an argument. Yeah, if you just stop and, and be quiet for a second, you actually can give the correct words that will, you know, help you to be, get on the upper hand of that argument. It's, but you have to be tranquil. Let's go on to 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Yeah, it's going to go on, guys. I promise you it is. For some of you, remember you guys are first. For some of you, you're actually feeling this already. Where, you know, it, you, you there's turmoil in your house. You have enemies living inside of your house. And they will they, they, they will try to turn you in according to what we leave here in 21. There's going to come a day when some of these people are going to turn you in. You know, um, you, you, whereas your, your mama or your daddy who may be materialistic right now are trying to convince you you should put your Bible down. Later on, they may be the same ones that, you know, actually call the police on you and try to have you arrested, you know, for your beliefs and such. This stuff is coming, guys. This is instruction for the 144,000. This is what you have to come, guys. And the thing is, you're not going to you're not. You're not going to be really allowed to hold it against them in the end. You're first. They're going to do this stuff to you. But then in the end, you know, some of these people will come around and you're still going to have to show them the love. And you're still going to have to give them the respect and, and help to help them get through. Something just popped in. in my, I know where it comes from when I say something popped in my head. But <clears throat> the, your children are really the only ones who are guaranteed to survive the tribulation. You guys who are 144,000. Your mama's not guaranteed, your daddy, your sister, your brother. You may lose all of your aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. Only, the only individuals that the scripture says that even your own life is, is kind of in jeopardy, you know, if, if you've, you know, completed all of your merits and you've done, you know, you've completed your life mission here on earth and you're ready to go on to higher dwelling places, you may die too. You know, the only people that's really expected to live are your children. You know, they I mean, those are the people that have a guarantee on their life. The one four four children have a guarantee that they will survive the tribulation. Um, um, you know, as, as long as, you know, you do you as long as you teach them right, you, you could be martyred. But if you've taught them, you know, the, the principles of Hermes, if they've learned the principles of Hermes, then, you know, then then they, they have a chance. But, you know, if you're 144,000 and, you know, you are um, entertaining the uh, bad women of Hermes, the the um, the, the, the bad uh, virtues there, the opposite of the, the 12 good virtues, if you if you then, you know, your whole family going to die. You're going to die and they're going to die, too. Ain't a whole lot to that. But if you are, you know, 144,000 on the right path to and, you know, your, your children have guarantees. But, you know, it's still going to be rough. It's still in, in the early stages there. There. What does it say? Brother. Um, uh, brother shall deliver up the brother to death. Yeah. You know, it, your own family members. You know, some of you guys are struggling. I, I knew at one point you were because you were sending a lot of messages to our channel, you know, saying, you know, this is going on and that's going on. It's your it's your loved ones that are used to harm you the most. Those who love you, the, the, those you love the most, those that love you the most, your sisters, your mothers, your, your these are the people that's actually going to be used to humiliate you and harm you, especially in the early stages, you know, to kind of prepare you to, you know, to get where you need to go. To, to help you with those merits kind of things they're going your loved ones are going to be the, the ones that target you first father and child children shall rise up against their parents yet yeah, all it is is going on and that's what you're seeing all right look at verse 22 and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he that endureth to the end shall be saved yeah this is why this is this is this is this is this is the hurtful part here and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. 
hated of all men you you're feeling that guys nobody wants anything to do with you especially when you are uh, preaching or teaching the word of god and what the scripture actually says these materialistic people these arrogant people these worldly people hate that they hate the message it ain't so much as they hate you you know you have to come to the realization that they are not rejecting you they are rejecting the word i should say that 20 times to make it sink in they're not rejecting you you know if you start talking about random stuff you know start talking about football or whatever it is that they they're interested in you know if, if they you know like movies or if they like fishing you talking about fishing y'all will have a wonderful conversation but the second you start crossing lines and start bringing in biblical doctrine, <laughs> they're going to start rejecting it. They're going to start getting away from it. And, it, and it, st it starts to feel like they're rejecting you guys and they're not. They're rejecting the word. They know it. They, they have no problem with it, you know, they, because they, they want they want you to know that, no, you're my brother. You're my sister. You're my dad. You're my son. I love you, you know. It's the word that, you know, it's that stuff that's coming out of your mouth that I don't really like, <laughs> you know. And so, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. You can't get up. You can't give up. You can't let them win. You have to stay strong. You have to stay in what you understand. There's a lot of people that do give up, guys. You know, um, like I say, I talk to a lot of people and I sometimes meet people that seems to at one point had a calling on their life similar to the one that I have on mine. But at some point they gave in. They quit. One dude said that, you know, after all of his friends and family turned on him, that he put down his book. And, you know, he literally said he stopped studying. He stopped reading. He stopped, you know, um, developing himself and he stopped his spiritual growth because he lost all his friends and family. You know, so now, you know, he does have his friends. He does have his family, I guess. But he does not have um, the years and years of, you know, um, 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 biblical knowledge that he should have gained from studying all of those years. All right. Let's go on. But when they persecute you in the city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the son of man come. All right, talking about, you know, when you're sojourning again, talking about when you find yourself, you know, on the road, maybe even in your own road. I Many you can go to city after city and every day you can go to a new city every day preaching the word and you will not cover this whole place before the son of man. You got plenty of places to go. That's what he's saying. There. You got plenty of room to 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 spread your message. Don't get stuck in one place thinking because the persecutions are so great that your ministry is over. No, just find somewhere else to go. Um, look at 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. All right. Now, you're the disciple. You understand what a disciple is. You know, understand that the Messiah was our master. All right. Well, what he's saying in 24 is if it happens to the if it happens to the master, if it happens to the Lord, then it's going to happen to you, too. You know, you're, you're not any different. You know, this is one of the problems that the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug is struggling with is, you know, the Messiah was barefoot and homeless, yet the pastor Deacon Dr. Doug, he got, you know, he got on a Gucci suit with a Rolex watch, you know, and some, you know, some uh, $500 shoes on, and he's not making the connection. He, he's not, and, and, and the Messiah who was suffering persecutions, now the uh, old Pastor Doug over there, he's he's being doted over every day, every time, every day. You know, people are are doting over him every day. They're they're get, they're singing his praises and buying him cars and you know and, you know coming and cleaning up his house and doing all kinds of stuff. You know, and there's a disconnect. And it's like, wait a minute, you were supposed to be the Messiah's example. He didn't have. You know, no five hundred dollar shoes on, or no, you know, brand new, you know, chariot that you know his followers purchased for him for him to move around. No, he walked around homeless. You know, so there's a bit of a disconnect there. Look at twenty five. He says, "It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant be as his lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much?" More shall they call them of his household. Talking about you guys at 144,000 and you suffer in these persecutions. Were they calling you satanic? It's like, really? Can you? Are you guys serious? Do you really believe that reading my Bible made me satanic? Are you serious? Yes, they are. <laughs> they believe that. They, they've gone for the doctrine of, of liberty where they feel like, you know, 
they are they are under the burden of having to follow the instructions of the Bible. They may not put it in that way, but that's basically what they're saying. And when they see you trying to follow the instructions of Moses or even the instructions of the Messiah who told you to follow the instructions of Moses, then they, they want to think that you are in error. They want to think that you are going backwards. They want to think that you are being led by Satan. But the thing is, guys, they did the Messiah the same way. Didn't they call him satanic every time he healed somebody every time you know they, they said that he would they, they called him Beelzebub so if they called him Beelzebub if they called him satanic don't you think they're going to call you satanic too you just a follower you just a, you you really a nobody like I say you may be 144,000 but the, the significance of that is that you're first you know you're not really any different than any, anybody else you just you know you just arrived first. You just got the tools first. You just got the gifts first. You learn how to pray while everybody else is still saying, God, do this and Lord, do that. You know, you were saying, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, you know, in your prayer. You kind of learned that before the rest of humanity with the mission of helping them. That's why you're first is so you can teach others. All right. But if they called him Satan, they gonna call you Satan too. All right, look at 26. He says, "Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known." Yeah, they gonna get it. They may not get it now. Give them some time. You know, you you may not it may not make sense to you now, but it's still early. You know, you gonna learn it. So as they call you satanic now, you know, you can shake the dust off your feet and maybe check back with them a year or two later to see, you know, if they if if, if they've learned anything. But you know, eventually they are gonna get it. What does it say? Every eye shall see. That means everybody gonna understand. You know, everybody, you ain't gonna see nothing with your eyeballs, but you're gonna see it with that third eye, that understanding eye, and you and it's gonna be clear. It's gonna be clear who's right. It's gonna be clear who's who's Beelzebub and who's confused, you know. It's just too early for it right now. We're still in we're still in a kind of the Piscean age where people love to be deceived. In the Piscean age, people prefer lies over the truth. That's why people like soap operas opposed to documentaries, you know. All right, but let's go on. Um, Verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, speak ye in the light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. This is talking about guys, you guys who are getting a lot of this stuff intuitively, you know. Um, I'm a bookworm. I kind of, you know, I, I, I... kind of get my information out of out of the books I get stuff intuitively too but it really only confirms what I've read in the scripture some of you guys haven't really read all of the scripture the way you should have I don't want to get preachy again but you know some of you guys haven't gotten around to actually reading the whole Bible yet so you're only really getting it intuitively you're only really hearing it in the ears you know you're only really hearing that message and you you, you know if you learn to meditate if you learn to get your merits, if you if you if you learn, you know, if, if, if you can progress a little bit, clean yourself up, so to speak, a little bit, you're going to hear a lot more of these messages. You're going to you know, you're going to get a lot more of these these um, divinations. And what he's saying is when you hear them, speak it in the light. You know, you you meditate there in the quiet of your bedroom. Well, what you hear there, go shout it. Go shout it from the housetops. It's like, hey, the Messiah is here. The Messiah is here. All right. Look at 28. And fear them not which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Yeah, don't be scared of these bammers. You know what I'm saying? I, I heard a song one time. The guy say, I don't fear nobody that got blood or breath like me. If they breathe air like I do or if they bleed like I do, I ain't scared of them. Yeah, why Why would I be? You, you you got breath like me. Why am I scared of you? You know what I mean? No, you got to fear him who's both able to destroy the body and the soul. And that's the Messiah. You know, Satan doesn't have power to destroy us. You know, go back to the book of Job where, you know, he pretty much, you know, you know, had to have permission even to touch uh, Job there. And even still then, you know, he wasn't really able to kill him. He, so that's not who he's talking about here. It's the Father. The Father, the Creator, He's the only one that can touch both your body and your soul. He's the only one that can do that. Man can do what he want to do. He can grab your thumbs and put them in a corkscrew and squeeze on them a little bit. But, you know, don't. so what? You know what I'm saying? You can't touch my soul. And, you know, you can't touch my spirit. You know, you know, have at it. You can do what you want to do for the, with this body. I'm going to get credit for it anyway. So, you know, have at it. 
All right, let's look at 29. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Yeah, he, he, see, he, he, one of the things that I learned in the Third Testament of the Bible, and some of you guys may have not have heard about the Third Testament. We give classes on it, give links. It's probably a link in the description to this Third Testament of the Bible that I'm talking about. But one of the things that it tells you in there is how our father has saturated everything on the planet. Even the sparrows, even the birds have his spirit in them, you know, so... And so he's he's accountable for every living creature on the planet. What does he say? Not a leaf shall blow without his permission or something like that. So he is aware of everything. And so what he's saying is even though people may be eating these birds, not one of them shall fall on the ground without your father. Which means that if it wasn't that it wasn't that time for that particular bird to go, you ain't going to find him. You know, you, you, you'll find another bird who the father, you know, had slated to be you know your meal or you know to be destroyed by you at that particular time let me go on all right <clears throat> but the very hairs of your hair are all numbered yeah think about that he knows exactly how many hair follicles you have in your head you know and how many you had when you was born and how many you are going to have when you die too he knows all about you and what he's saying here again is don't worry about those people who want to do you harm he has you covered is what the message is he 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 has every hair on your head protected and only those things that he allowed to come on you will come on you. And if, and if, it, and if something comes on you that is unpleasant, it's probably for your benefit. It's probably something to help you to gain merits. We gave a class on merits and you learned that we are, um, we do gain merits through doing good deeds, charitable deeds, but we also gain merits from pain and being harmed and hurt, even if it's just, a, you know, smashing your finger in the door kind of thing. All right, so, but let's go on. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more, ye are of more value than any sparrows. Yeah, we the top dogs down here on the earth. We may not be the top dogs in all of the universe, but, you know, this is our planet. We have dominion over everything. The whole world was created for us, especially you 144,000ers, which are the bride, you know, the earth was created for you specifically. You and those who will survive the tribulation, you know. We're kind of in a age where, you know, uh, Satan has rule over the Bible. I mean, Satan has rule over the world right now. We learned that back when the Messiah was led up on the uh, mountain for 40 days and tempted by the devil. That's one of the things that the devil told him. You know, this is my world. You know, I can give it to you if I want to, you know. But, you know, and that's where we're at in this Piscean age where Satan is really allowed to, you know, control this world. But the transition that we're about to make into the Aquarian age, Satan is locked up, you know, and then it becomes the um, we, we get that kingdom of heaven for real. Then, um, well, I shouldn't say for real. We get the kingdom of heaven material then because all of the so-called kings of the earth will be gone. And the only real ruler who will be on the planet will be the father. It's never really happened before. Devil has always ran this planet, and you know, all the way back to Pharaoh, all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar, all the way back to Nimrod, all the way back to Cain. Satan has ran this world. This world is his. But when we finish this uh, tribulation period, Satan and all his little minions are going into a um, into a place that they're gonna be gone for a thousand years, and we're gonna have peace here on this earth. And <clears throat> that's what we have to expect. So, but let's go on. He said, 32 says, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my father, which is in heaven. Now, this is what we was talking about a few, few, um, a few minutes ago, talking about people being martyred. Some of you guys are going to be martyred. Yeah, some, some of you for, for various reasons, you know, some of you will have completed your life mission. You know, that's important here. That's why we're here on the earth. People act like they don't know what, what, what's the meaning of life. The reason why you have a shell, a body to walk around in, a human body to carry your spirit in, is to fulfill a particular life mission. You, saw, you, you made a contract with the Father ever before you was allowed to come here and be born in a child. You, you, you made an agreement with him to do certain things. Well, once you have completed those things, you get to go on to what's called the higher dwelling places. You get to go on to um, 
uh, higher mansions, so to speak. You remember, it was Enoch and other people who taught us about the seventh heaven, the seven levels of heaven, the seven levels of heaven. And we find out in the Third Testament that being human is like the first level. We got six more levels to go, you know. So... <clears throat> So some of you will be martyred because of that. Others of you will be martyred because of this right here. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, he will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven because they're going to deny him. Some of the 144 are going to deny him. Remember that you know the, 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 the 144 is, is not so much as the people as it is the number, you know. You may be 144,000, you may have the calling on your life, but that doesn't matter. Just because you have the calling doesn't mean you're going to answer the call, right? And so there may be millions of people who receive the call of the 144,000, millions of them it could have been. But what's the, what the deal is, is from what I understand, from what the deal is, is when you have 144,000 People who have received the call, answered the call, and have now prepared themselves and ready to go. When you have 144,000 that are ready, that's when it's going to jump off. It, it may be somebody, somebody's going to be over there hollering, hey, ain't I one of the 144,000? Hey, I'm supposed to be with you guys. And they're going to be like, no, you didn't answer the call. You, you know. We got enough. We ready to go. You know, you're going to miss the boat kind of thing. That's why we need to be preparing now, you know, you know, quit worrying about all this worldly stuff and jumping our Bibles so that we can make sure and, and make sure you get Hermes, the shepherd of Hermes. You know, we, that's what that's what this channel is. That's how this channel got started. It's from the book called the shepherd of Hermes. You really need to get the information that is in that book in order so that you can make sure that you will be in that number. You know, make sure that you will answer the call. Make sure that you are prepared for, you know, the mission that is set before you. If not, you, you could get martyred and you can make an example of somebody going to have to die. You know, somebody going to have to be martyred. Somebody, and, and I mean some of us, some of you, some of the 144 are going to be martyred. Why? Because the scripture says so. You know, who is it going to be? From what I understand, it is those that deny his name, those that deny him. Let's look right here. 33, it says, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father, which is in heaven. Yeah, these guys, some of those guys are going to be martyred, too. You know, it's their rejection of him. They, they, basically, what it boils down to is that they're going to choose the world over the father. While their mother, their daddy, their sister, their friends, you know, all of these people are saying, you know, what you believe in ain't real. What you believe in ain't true. Some of these guys are going to fall for that. You know, they're going to, they're going to, like I was talking to the earlier, where the friends, where the guy lost all his friends and family and decided to put his Bible down. You guys are going to be martyred. You're going to be martyred. You know, you're going to be made from what I understand from, you know, and I, and I realize I'm, I may be on the verge of making stuff up because I don't actually have a verse to point to you exactly, except, you know, um, the third Testament, um, you're going to be the one that's going to be martyred. You're going to be one made an example of. It's kind of a wake up call for the rest of the people is that you're going to be made an example of. Think about after the Messiah passed, after the Messiah died, after they put him on a cross, what happened to the so-called universal church as it was called in. For 300 years, the disciples of the Messiah still carried the message. They, they carried the message around, but they were under constant persecution from the Romans, from the emperors and those guys, Constantine and those guys were trying to kill them. But one of the things about it, as they as as they killed the so-called universal churches, they killed the disciples and they killed the followers of the, of the Messiah. The more they harmed them, the more these people strengthened themselves around the word. And so that's what's going to happen to some of you guys in the end is you're going to be killed so that the rest of us can say, hey, wait, these people are serious. Let me go grab my Bible and start reading it here. So you're going to be made an example of. All right, but let's go on. Think not that I've come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. Now, you need to get this part. You guys at 144,000, you need this part needs to be internalized, you know, because it, it seems counterintuitive. It's like the Messiah. He was a peaceful. He was a humble guy. Yeah, if you are a minister or a father, you're supposed to be peaceful and humble. He said, no, uh -uh. think not that I come to send peace on the earth. He didn't come to make this place peaceful and, and everybody get along sitting, sitting around, you know, eating on you know, chocolate Easter candy and, you know, having Christmas parties and everybody just, you know, everybody just getting along. Huh? What is it? 
things that coexist. He don't really, he didn't come in for it to, to coexist. What does he say? I come not to send peace, but a sword. No, he come to, to um to stir stuff up, to get stuff moving. You know, to get stuff the way it's supposed to be. And it's for I am, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Right. It says, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Yeah, he comes to stir stuff up. He didn't come to bring peace. Bring be, peace, guys. I'm sorry to say I've experienced this. Being peace means acquiescing to the other side. You have to lose. The only way you're going to have peace in your house is if you put down all of your beliefs, close your Bible and start acting like them. Otherwise, it's going to be a war. They're going to keep fighting against you. I'm talking from personal experience, guys. The only way you're going to have peace is if you, you know, if, if you deny the father. As long as you stand up for the father, these people are going to target you. You're going to be persecuted. This is, you know, you might as well deal with it. All right. Um, what is it? Uh, and a man's foe shall be they of his own house. Yeah. A lot of you guys are experiencing it, especially as spouses, <laughs> your husbands and your wives. These guys, you know, if they're not on the same path as you, and chances are they're not, you know, there's not a whole lot of 144,000ers around. There's not a lot of you guys. And the chances of you and both, you both and your husband or you both and your wife being 144,000 is probably slim to none. Probably one in a billion for two of you to be in the same household that, that, that would be kind of you know unnecessary. You don't really need a whole lot of guys. You really just need one in order to point you to the scripture. So chances are your your wife and your 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 or your husband is different, right? And so what's going to end up happening? They're gonna be your enemy. You know they may not always be your enemy, but at some point you're gonna find these people are going to these people your children. They're gonna be foes in your own household. They're gonna be working against what it is because, like I said, they have years and years of worldly doctrine in them, and now you're talking about something opposite. And you know they're gonna to want to go back to the worldly stuff. They're gonna to want to hold on to the worldly stuff, and so they're gonna reject you or reject the father. Um, and and he's, he's going to meet the members of your own house. <laughs> like I said, he uses he uses your loved ones. Your, your loved ones will be used to hurt you. All right. Look at verse 37. He that love a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that love a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, now what this is talking about is when you find yourself in a position where you have a loved one, a mother, a father, a son, or a daughter who wants to maintain their materialism, their materialism or their worldly, you know, stuff and they come at you saying, "Hey, you supposed to be like us." You know, like like I talked about earlier, don't be like the guy who closes his Bible and then runs back over there with them. No. You know, you choosing to have friends or you choosing to have uh, a good relationship with your parents or your children, you, you and and you are putting down um the father in order to do so, you're closing your Bible so that you can have good relations with these humans that are walking around. You ain't worthy of him. Yeah, you ain't worthy of him. You're going to be disobedient to his word. You're going to be breaking the Sabbath day. You're going to be um, um, acting like them. You're going to be acting like worldly folks. That's why they're persecuting you in the first place is that you're acting different. You're making them feel guilty. You're making them feel like what they're doing is in error and they don't like that. And the only way that you're going to make them get along with you is you make them feel comfortable again and that's putting aside your your you putting aside what the father has taught you so don't do that don't you might as well get ready for a fight remember it said he who endures to the end shall be saved you have to endure to the end remember in another place he says every eye shall see him or you know everything is going to be revealed it's just too early right now and you have to survive to the end you have to you have to work your way through it you have to deal with those persecutions and those those crosses and such and work your way through it it's necessary all right, um, let's look at 38. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now, we have to understand what the cross is. Now, the cross is all of the persecutions and different stuff and, and, and um, humiliations and tortures that you have to go to simply by being a disciple or a follower of the scripture. Remember all that the Messiah went through there in the, in the passion, in his passion, those those last days, those last times. He, and this is a good example. It's kind of on a side note. But you remember, they said, who is the Messiah? 
The Messiah means messenger. They said, who is the Messiah? And uh, the Christ, uh, the Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus, as the Bible called him, he stepped forward and he said, I am the Messiah. Guys, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't tell nobody that you are 144,000. Don't tell nobody that you are divine envoy. Don't tell nobody that you have this mission on your life because the second you do, the same thing that happened to the Christ is going to happen to you. You're going to suffer the cross. You're going to be persecuted. It's going to get rough. There, some people can attest to this. They stood up and they said, hey, I, I know I can. And they stood up and said, hey, I'm 144,000. And then the trials hit, right? But that's just an inside note. But let's go on. Look right here. He says, he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. So once these persecutions come, once they start spitting on you and putting the crown of thorns on you and, you know, calling you satanic and slapping on you and doing all of these horrible things to you. If you don't take up that cross and follow after him, you're not worthy of me. The humiliations, the persecutions, the torture, the lies, the accusations, the name calling. If you're not willing to put up with all of that stuff, if you're not willing to do that, just like the Messiah did. He says, you're not worthy of me. So you have to, you have to, you have to do it. Look at 39. He said, he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. <clears throat> In 2014, 2014 was the sabbatical year. Sabbatical year, meaning a lot of people lost their jobs. That's what it means. It, to, to, they, they, they were actually removed from. From their slavery, from bondage, they were removed from the worldly systems. A lot of people all around the world, and you guys can attest to this in the comments, but a lot of people in, in had transitions in their life in 2014 as, as a result of this sabbatical year. They lost their jobs. But how many of them ran back, ran back to the unemployment office and got their jobs back? That's what it's talking about here. They went to find their life back instead of just, you know, um, embracing what the father ha has in store for them and just rolling with, with what was coming. Huh? They jumped right back into the world systems. They ran right back and found jobs. They found welfare. They found, you know, other stuff. They 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 did not stay on the path that the father had them on. They ran back to the worldly systems. And it's saying right here, he that finds his life shall lose it. Those that did that, those who found himself um, in a sabbatical year going through a life change and did not accept that change and ran back into the worldly systems when it all goes down those worldly systems are going to let them down and are going to actually end up losing that life that they tried to preserve they tried they tried to make sure they had money and make sure they had nice houses and cars and all of that stuff well when all of that stuff goes away they're going to lose they're going to lose too they're going to lose out too and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it, meaning, you know, people who, you know, lost their, that, that comfort level, got knocked down a few pegs, so to speak, and, you know, embraced it and said, okay, this is my new life. Look at verse 40. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Yeah, so, like I said, not everybody's going to hear your, your message. But those that actually hear the message that are coming from you, they're actually hearing the message from the Father. So if they receive you, they're going to receive him. But the opposite is true, too. If they are rejecting the, what you're saying, if they're not wanting to hear the message that are coming out of, out of your mouth, what does he say? He that receiveth you will receive me, and he that receiveth me shall receive him that sent me. The, the opposite is true, too. If they're rejecting you, then they are rejecting him. You know, you guys are the messengers. You guys are, like I say, don't tell nobody. Keep it a secret. But you are the messengers. You are the help. You are what's going to help people to, 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 to receive the message that they have to, to receive in order to survive the tribulation. But if they're rejecting you, then, you know, they're going to reject him. And essentially, they're rejecting the, the most high, the Father, the creator as well. Look at verse 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Talking about talking about you, you, you disciples. You 144,000, you're supposed to be carrying the message of the Father. And so you're coming in the name of the Father. So he who receives you coming in the name of the Father actually receives the Father too. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, 
he shall in no wise lose his reward. All right, now from what I understand about this verse right here, I'm, I'm struggling with it a little bit. But what it sounds like to me, okay, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but it's saying it, even if you just come because I, because a disciple told you to, even if you even if you just do a thing because coach tells you to do, it, and you know me, I promote charitable deeds all the time. So even if you were to go and give a glass of cold water. Just because coach told you to do so, you shall in no wise lose your reward. You're still doing a good deed and you're going to get credit for it even if you don't understand why, why you're doing it. Even if you're doing it just because a disciple told you to do it is the way I understand it there. And we could bounce that off of 41. But I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, y'all. Subscribe to our channel. Push the like button. Uh, leave a comment. Share this on, on your channel. Hermes Academy. Pray for us. Power, patience, continence, and faith. We teach virtue.